property. But then I realized chips last a long time and are acid forming. So for some things like like uh, blueberries, I love chips. This works really good, lasts a long time. You don't have to freshen up all the time. But, you know, something like grapes, I'm going to be freshening it up every year to do insect control, to be more organic, to be less pesticide use. You know, my theory is is the least amount of pesticide, let's do IPM. You know, integrated pest management is very important with that. And I I didn't mean to be a smart aleck about that. I I really was serious. I think whatever your preference is is what really matters on that. Tree fruit. We'll try to cover some of these. Of course, I had to put pawpaw up here because it's my most favorite of all tree fruits. I'm the pawpaw king, or I I call myself that anyway in there. We're going to look at uh, just a few things. Fruit selection. Uh, We'll look at some cultural stuff. Root stocks, you've got a list of root stocks in there. We'll talk about some of the root stocks if you have interest in some of those. I'm only going to do this for about 10 minutes and I'm just going to quit. Okay, because uh, I, I want to take you outside. A lot of times we learn by looking, okay? Uh, and you can ask questions out, out there. You know, what fruit can be grown in North Carolina? All of them, you know? I mean, really, we have got a great state to do that. There's great environments. You just have to know the chilling chilling root requirements. Why don't we have great peach orchards in this area here? Why? What? It's cold. They grow here fine. They do fine. They're great for homeowners, but they're not predictable. Why? Because the chilling requirement is so low. So what happens is we get the chilling requirement done, and then uh, 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 they're ready to start growing in December and blooming in December. Well, you know, it warms up, the buds open up, and they freeze. That's the problem. The chilling requirement is so low on peaches. Same thing with different apples. So we can choose those trees that match the environment, the microclimate that you have. If you're at a high elevation, you'll choose something that works best for that or a rootstock that works best for that. You know, figs will grow best in eastern North Carolina and southern Piedmont. Bull crap, I can grow figs here. But you've got to know what variety you've got. You've got to know how to do that. You may have to do protection. I mean, you know, you go to New York State and the mountains there and they've got fig orchards. How do they do that? You know, they know what they're doing in that variety, you know. All we think about here is brown turkey. Well, there's, you know, there's verde, there's negre, there's, there's 69 varieties that are grown in North Carolina. You know, so if you really want figs in the homeowner situation, you put them in a protected site. You put them on a certain size of the house to where you're getting, like like the uh, east side, to where you're getting some warmth from that. I mean, a fig can fig produces on new wood, so if it freezes back and it grows back, it can still produce. The problem we have with like brown turkey, it freezes to the ground. It takes so many days. It's, it's into October, and it hasn't ripened. So you've got to just pick the varieties in there. I actually have a producer that's going to try figs on a small scale for the tailgate market. And, you know, with the, in the chocolate, we have all these chocolate companies. They want unusual fruits to mix with their chocolates, and figs is one of them that they really like to have in there. Uh, well-drained soil. You can't put any kind of tree fruit in a soggy soil. Very important. pH is around 6.0 to 6.5, so you've got to do adjustments. Tree fruits, you know, most of the soil tests that you're going to be uh, taking uh, are going to be uh, at the 6-inch level. You're going to probably do two levels on some tree fruits if you're trying to do an orchard. You're going to do a 6-inch level where you've got, and you're going to go a little deeper. So you're going to do a two, two levels on that because they're going to be doing uh, pulling nutrition from about 12 to 16 inches down. So you're going to want a little bit more uh, a change in fertility there. If you've got a real acid or shallow soil, you want to know what that pH is down below there. If it's at 6.0, you're fine in there. Uh, watch for frost pockets. I can't believe it. There, there it is. Yeah, we got it right here. Has to have full sun. Avoid areas by large shade trees. I'll, um, I lived in Winston-Salem. For years and years and years in the old Salem area, real old section of town, the oldest community on the south side of town. I live in a place called Washington Park. I had no trees in my yard. 
zero trees in my yard. I thought I could do uh, tomatoes really well and, and fruit trees and stuff. So uh, uh, I had a, a, do- a neighbor behind me. I called her the dog Nazi. Oh, hussy. But, uh, uh, so, so I put four raised beds in the backyard, and then I put my fruit trees in, you know, thinking I had full sun. I had shadows that I didn't know. She called the city on me. The city come in because she said I, was, I had graves in my backyard. It was four raised beds. <laughs> And at the back of the raised beds, I had, you know, a blueberry bush. So it looked like I had a headstone there. And she'd sit up on her porch. So I finally got my daughter. I said, when that hussy goes out of the town, let's go up. And she stood on the, on the porch. And I positioned plants to where she couldn't see my backyard. But anyway, so you've got to know your, you've got to watch your land. My point in the jokey tale was you've got to watch your land. I actually wound up taking all that out because I didn't get full sun. I needed full sun at least six to eight hours a day. I could grow great lettuces in the hot summer, but it was the poplar trees that were 700 feet tall and my neighbors that were shadowing me, even though I had a very small yard. So you've got to assess your yard over a time period in there. We do have nematode problems, and it's very detrimental to trees and hard to treat once you've got them. Pretty much we don't have problems in western North Carolina with nematodes except for in the bottom soils where we have, have pulled nematodes from Florida. You know, we bring plants up from other states and uh, our soils didn't naturally have negative nematodes. I have seen the largest numbers of nematodes in tomato fields in my career in Haywood and Henderson County. But every one of those fields were buying plants out of another state. And that's where they came from. So you know, it's a good, it's a good to get, to get a spectrum. It only costs five dollars if you're going to do an orchard, and you're depending on that. You know, recommend to somebody if they've bought a piece of property on the bottom soil that's had a lot of vegetables grown there. There's a possibility you could have some detrimental nematodes. And you get a nematode count with the cheapest state in the United States for doing that with NC Department of Agriculture. Poor site selection. Look at those shadows. That's a Craig goof up right there. Trees everywhere. Oh, I've spent $26 from this tree and 26 for that tree. I gave them all away because I didn't have full sun. You don't want to make that mistake that I made. That's a good site for tree fruits. You want good sun, good exposure. You want to be up across the frost line. You don't want to put a tree fruit small orchard in a what we call a frost pocket. And if you think about that in elevations... Where is this frost lays in the lower section? So you want to be on the upper end of a slope when you're doing that. Even if your house is on the upper end of a slope, your whole yard may be great for fruit trees because the frost pocket's below you. I, the farm I had was above what we call the snow line in Teleco area, Snowbird, if you're familiar with West North Carolina where I grew up there. So I would have snow when nobody else had it. I had the great opportunity to grow. I didn't get frost. I just had layers of snow and layers of snow which blanketed me and actually gave me protection with my tree fruits in there. Varieties, if, taste it. If you like it, it will grow. You know, it's like apples. What apples to, should I grow? As a master gardener on the phone line, what varieties should I grow? Anything you want. What do you like to eat? You know, do you like tart? Do you like sweet? Do you want honey crisp? Do you want crimson crisp? Do you want... You know, wine sap, I want wine sap because I, I like that. That's one I use for my applesauce because I make fruit roll-ups. Now i got grandkids, I'm doing 20 a day. You know, So you know, it's whatever your preference is, you're going to be able to, to, to grow that here in the tree fruit area. In there. Uh, most of them will grow. The big deal is pollination. So you've got a chart, and I think this is in your uh, book, but, but you know, peaches are self Self-pollinating, they're self-fruitful. But then you get up to something like a pear, you need, or an Asian pear, you're going to have to have two to have good fruit production because they're not self-fertile. That, that's in there. Apples, it varies. You know, you get into some of the roms, you need two varieties, or, you know, a delicious type. And you're going to have a heavier production if you've got two varieties. <coughs> okay, let's go on to root stalks. All commercial fruit trees have been budded or grafted. We used to say this wasn't true. I don't know of any place now that you can get a fruit tree that is not grafted onto something else. It's just not economical to do that. We don't use standard trees. A lot of the 
folks are going to use what's called an M. If you like a standard tree, you're going to use something like an M11, an M111 rootstock, which is going to give you 70% of that mature height and a heavy fruit production. You know, so we're actually, even with standard trees now, we're, we're grafting them uh, on the apple trees. You either have a spur or non-spur type. Red Delicious is a spur type. It's just those little tiny limbs that have the little wrinkles like my face, just little wrinkles on them. That's where, that's called a spur, and they'll live for many, many years in there, and that helps to have a compact growth. If you're pruning and cutting off all your spurs, you're cutting off all your apple trees. I can't tell you the people that I've seen that go in and just cut all the little spurs off because I think their little water sprout's fixing to go up, and they're the spurs that are making their fruit clusters. But not all trees have that. The, uh, in there. I think Rome is another one. Here's a rootstock uh, chart, and I hope I can't remember where I got this from, but you know, that M111 I was talking about, you know, if you look at that, a seedling is 100%. That's what we compare to. And that particular rootstock is very close to that. But you're going to have a heavier production. You're going to have fruit bearing earlier. So that's why we're uh, uh, doing that. Most of what's common in our area, is an M9. M9 has become very popular because you're getting 35% of the height of a mature tree, but yet you're, you're, you're getting uh, fruit bearing in two to three years. You know, you don't have to wait so long, especially when you get old and crotchety like me. In there, you want fruit quicker in there. Uh, cultural practices. Fall, early winter is the best time to do it. So you'll have time for them to root over the season. It's very difficult to get fruit trees because your commercial people are, have got it sewed up. It's hard to get, you know, uh, commercial trees in the fall and winter. Most of them are done here in the spring. You'll see them on the market. And I've been so surprised the last three years at the box stores and the quality of fruit trees they've got out there. Most of the fruit trees are going to be in whips. And a whip is just a one, a one uh, stem tree that comes in. The first thing you do is cut it. The reason why you're cutting it is to make, remember, cut the end, break bud down below. So you've got all these choices when I show you how to prune in just a minute in there. If, you get a, uh, if you're ordering trees, they're going to come uh, by root. And you want that graft union to be above the ground three to four inches. If the graft union gets below, it's going to sprout and you're going to have the root stock making apples. And that's not very tasty, especially with M9 is really a quince rootstock. So you're not going to get a true apple. You're going to get something hard and hideous. It's not going to grow good. So uh, uh, on there. Okay, weed control is imperative under tree fruits. They cannot compete. So we want to have most of our nurseries and our uh, orchards are going to be bare. They're going to be bare ground. Nut trees are the same way because we actually vacuum up nut tree new, uh, uh, nuts in, in Oregon, the uh, hazelnuts. We can grow hazelnuts here. People just don't grow them for some reason. But, you know, uh, hazelnuts out there, are usually like a vacuum cleaner, and they vacuum up the nuts, and it goes into a little container in there. But uh, voles are a real problem for us because we do a lot of mulching in the home garden. We like those tree rings, and that's a, a great place for voles. And voles love to eat fruit trees. They like the bark on there. It's got a real thick cambium, so they're really going to munch on them. So we have to watch for voles. So a lot of times a guard, you'll see a lot of the trees planted, they have these little tree guards on there. That's to keep the deer from eating them. I call deer rats now, big tall rats, you know, because they just, they just need to be killed, I just think. They just, they just eat up all the vegetables in the world. In there, so. uh, but herbicides are used a lot. Mechanical cultivation is not recommended, so just mulch your trees and watch for your voles and give some protection on there. Fertility, uh, if you're getting less than 10 inches of growth on a fruit tree, look at fertilizing. Because I know you're going to forget to take your soil test every year, so take a soil test, but if you don't take a soil test, you know, if you're getting massive growth on the fruit tree, don't worry about fertilizing it, you're getting enough. So 10 inches is what I tell commercial people. If you're getting that much growth every year on your fruit tree, and you don't want it to go to the moon anyway, you want it to be able to stay to where you can pick with just a little bit of a small ladder, or something. you know, like three to four whirls, when we get to talking about whirls in a minute. I'm going through this quick. Uh, fruit thinning is very important. 
in the mountains here, we have a lot of fruit set a lot of times. Every other year, a lot of times we'll have a heavy fruit set. If you have a heavy fruit set this year and you don't fruit then, you may not have fruit the next year. Because while this fruit is being produced, your buds for the next year are being set. So if you've got a heavy fruit set on a tree fruit this year, you need to thin it four to six inches, four to eight inches apart with a little plastic bat. You have the kids out there and have a war of those little sabers that the kids have, you know, Star Wars things. Pap them with that or a ball bat. Knock some of those fruit off of there. We use seven. It's what we use to thin our fruit trees pretty much in the commercial industry or some kind of gibberellons or something like that. But, you know, a good bat works just as good. Wait, so I've never <coughs> heard of fruit thinning. Can you clarify that? You're taking off... You're throwing away fruit. Now, apples, a lot of times, peaches, peaches will self-abort. They will thin themselves. Because as a master gardener on the phone lines, you're going to get a lot of calls if they've got plums or peaches. Oh, my God, my peaches are falling on the ground. Well, that's a good thing. I'm so glad that your peach tree is thinning itself. You want them eight inches apart. Well, think about that. If you've got a cluster of five apples, from a rome especially, because they're spur-forming, Rums is spur forming or a red delicious is spur forming and the cluster comes out, you got five apples, you really only want one to two. So you take a ball bat and knock some of them off. Literally shake the limb and the ones that are trying to go off will fall off. Before they're which is May and June. Okay. When they're a little bitty. Little bit. Huh? The peaches thin themselves a lot more than the other fruit trees. If you start seeing a peach uh, drop you know, I mean, if you thin them before they start doing it, they won't thin. Yeah, but peaches will do a lot of self thinning, especially your cling, the freestone, the freestones will. Your white peaches hang on a lot. You know, the white flesh peaches hang on a little bit more. Okay, we're almost. I'm gonna go one more minute. I want to get to pruning. See, that's what it looks like. See how these clusters come three to five. That's what you want. Does that make sense to you now? You know, in there. Okay, uh, training and pruning. Let's just go to that right quick. What you want is a central leader system for... I thought I had a chart on that. Anyway, most fruit trees that are uh, stone fruits are going to be open center where you let the center be in the uh, middle like peaches. You know, those kind of things. But primarily in the homeowners, uh, nut trees, apple trees, pears... Those kind of uh, trees are going to be what we call a central leader, which means you have a one leader that goes up with what we call limbs coming out, and those are called whorls. So when you first get the tree and you plant it in the spring, even though it's going to kill you, you cut it off. Just cut the top off? Yes, whack it off. <laughs> okay? And uh, if you've got a whip... Now, nowadays, the nurserymen are trying really hard to give you that first whirl, which is this. This is a whirl. I'm going to get to it in a minute. See it right there? That's the whirl. That's what you want. And that's an equidistant limbs like this. One's here and it goes up. So that's a whirl where you've got a limb over here, a limb over here, a limb over here and a limb over here. Four if you can get them, but the tree don't listen to me half the time. It's going to do what it wants to do. Okay, It's going to grow the way it wants to, and you adjust to that. So we're cutting that off right there to make buds break down through here. Okay, And then it'll have a lot of limbs break. And I've got photographs we'll look at really quick too. And I'm sorry I'm going over in there, but this is very important for you. So we want to have from the ground to here about 30 to 40 inches, somewhere in there where my first whirl starts, okay? If you can get that concept in your head where there's a nice equidistant grouping of three limbs, okay? If you've got a serious deer problem or a bear problem, you don't want to start this whirl taller. A lot of times you'll go to a nursery and if they're buying quality plants, they will already have that first whirl made for you. You know, so if you're picking one out and it's got a lot of limbs on it, find one that has good equidistant limbs at this first whirl. Okay. You don't have to cut it off? No. You've already got a whirl. You're going to have apples a year early. 
Okay? That's where you're going to spend $36 for that tree, too. Because they have trained it to this point. Okay, so we buy the tree. We cut it off. The buds break all summer. Okay? So this summer, I'm going to pick my whirl down here. One, two, three, four. Okay, I'm cutting everything else down, but I'm leaving this pretty limb here, this pretty limb there, that pretty limb there. And it would be wonderful if they were all at the same point and looked like that, but they don't. One will be here and four inches, another one will come out over here. So we pick those out and then we, we leave them. We cut all the others. And then we look at the top of the tree and we say, oh my God, there's a billion limbs up here. All you want is one leader because you want a distance from this last limb of that whorl to here to be about 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. So I'm going to say, okay, I've got three limbs at the top and I've got a photograph of this in a minute and I'm going to show you. So we'll, do, we'll look at it twice. So I'm saying, okay, I think I'm going to keep one of these. Which one do I keep? I don't care which one ever you want to keep. One. You want one central leader. So I cut that one off and cut that one off, and I decided I'm going to keep A. Okay, so now I've done my, my shaping. I'm training this tree to be a central leader. We want a nice crotch angle here of 60 degrees. We don't want it narrow like the uh, pears that we have that are cracking all over the town, you know, the little pears that twist out. We want it to be like this. If it's not, then we do a stretcher. This summer, we put a little limb in there. You know, I have my own way of stretching. I don't buy fancy stretchers with nails on the ends. Masking tape is your best friend. That's, why, that's how we train walnut trees, because you're going to go out there and put a piece of stick in there to stretch that limb out. You're going to go over and be working in the tomatoes, and you're going to forget about the fruit tree. And then it's going to grow around that. Masking tape will last a season, and then it rots, and the limb falls out. So I'll put my little stretcher here, and I actually cut a piece of apple limb that I've cut off up here, and I'll stretch that right there, and I'll mask and tape it on this side, mask and tape it down here. If you can follow me, I'll show you when, when we get out there. And then I go away and pick with it. Next year, that's rotted, and that little thing fell out, and my limb is there, and, I, and it's over with. Okay, that's a Craig thing. I made it up myself. Okay. So we have the whirl down here. And in the dormant season, we've chosen that one. It kept growing up there. Remember, we chose that one. So in that, that first winter, we want that... It's gotten, you know, five feet up here. We don't want five feet. We want about 18 inches. So again, we cut it, okay, you know, in that winter. So now we're trying the next year to make another whirl up here. The new lateral out. Yes. And then we choose those and cut all the other limbs off. We want the shape of it to be like a Christmas tree. So you've got, you know, a drawing, a whirl, a whirl, a whirl. And this could be one here, one here, one here. And then there are these three and in the space. Does that make sense at all? I'm going to show you in uh, another picture of it right now in a second. That's what the top view is going to look like. So in multiple years... You've got all these laterals that are going to be having apples all over them. So this one's going to go out here. We whack it back to there. So we've got these 